Besides death and taxes, the only thing guaranteed in life is that anime is trash and we are all trash for liking it. But what if I told you that hidden deep within the conspicuous quagmire of terrible pacing, egregious fan service, and the charmingly ham-fisted therapy no jutsu, there exists a show so boldly ambiguous, so defiantly subtle, so unapologetically not trash that it had to be labeled an avant-garde experiment just to protect the structural integrity of the medium. That show is called Mono no Ken and if you haven't heard of it, that's okay. I don't hold it against you. But you're absolutely why we can't have good anime all the time. Not to be confused with the very good, but not quite as good, Ghibli movie, Princess Mononoke, Mono no Ken just Mononoke, was a 12-episode miniseries released by Toei Animation in 2007. It was born as a spin-off of the third and final arc of the previous year's horror anthology series, Ayakashi Samurai Horror Tales, following the nameless medicine vendor from that series and a collection of new encounters he has hunting Mononoke. The slight exception is the Bakaneko, which returns from the original run, but in a completely different story. But what is a Mononoke, you ask? Well, I... I, I don't really know. I still don't know a lot about this series, which I remind you can be a good thing, but allow me to work through my best understandings of it. A Mononoke is a type of yokai, or more specifically, an evil ayakashi made physically manifest by binding itself to the negative karma of a human, like a grudge or a curse. As far as the narrative is concerned, they make perfect antagonists, existing as literal physical threats while inherently linked to the metaphorical concepts being explored. The series is built on these two to three episode arcs, each dealing with an individual Mononoke. It's not an uncommon pacing style in anime, a good example is the almost conversely dense Monogatari series, but Mononoke has, in a deceptively simple twist, basically no overarching story. Resembling a narrative roguelike, each arc effectively replays the basic structural formula, but with a different focus or perspective. The medicine vendor finds himself in the company of strangers, who are off-put by his otherworldly aura, his effeminate eyes and buttery voice, but mostly by his magic talking sword, which at the time were illegal for anyone but samurai to carry. These shady characters are, without fail, revealed to be in some way related to whatever Mononoke is currently haunting the area, and waste a good deal of the medicine vendor's precious time not telling him their dirty little secrets while he puzzles together the three metaphysical requirements to use his magic sword. The shape, truth, and reason of the Mononoke, which are roughly translated but more or less mean the type of yokai it is, the thing it wants, and the reason why. Since nobody ever wants to just nut up and talk about what they did to help create a murderous demon, the series tends to run a little light on dialogue, and this is where it really finds a way to excel. Not unlike the varying contours of mythology, Mononoke makes aggressively liberal use of creative freedom to tell a complex story through atmosphere. As you may have noticed, this show puts the word idiosyncratic into perspective, using digital animation to develop an art style similar to Yukio paintings and to overlay it on a parchment paper pattern. It's bizarrely colorful and almost nauseatingly directed, and that's really just the start. So yes, experimental, I concede that. But there's no such thing as experiment without purpose, or I guess in this case, roughly translated anyway, without consequence. Unsurprisingly, the themes Mononoke explores are human vice and, on rare occasions, the vices of humans. There aren't many cliches quite as overdone and underachieving as people are the real monsters, but Mononoke wastes no time being impressed with its own darkness and allows the viewer to develop their own interpretations of right and wrong instead of screaming at them that there is no right or wrong. Moral ambiguity is a lot like drinking. The more you talk about it, the less people actually want to invite you to their cool parties. It all starts with the medicine vendor. It really doesn't work without him. Unlike a certain other nameless anti-hero, he's not presented as a cynic with something to gain and a shell to eventually break through. His presence is practically alien, his motivations entirely unclear. 
His only real interest appears to be in slaying Mononoke, and the triflings of the people he deals with never really exceed the spectrum of amusing to annoying. In the opening acts, he often comes across as the most unsettling thing in the room, an unusual and intimidating creature cutting through the dreamlike air of a gathering of strangers. Without exception, he enters the scene aware that there's a Mononoke lurking somewhere, and everyone who has the misfortune of his company is somehow involved. It puts them on edge, naturally, and as the perspective shifts to the Mononoke and the medicine vendor as both their judge and jury, the pressure tightens, the dreamlike air turns eerie, and then morphs into a surreal nightmare. Now I will preface this next part by saying, no, Mononoke is not scary. If you're looking for a traditionally frightening horror anime, stop, it doesn't exist. That kind of horror just doesn't mix with animation. But there are other equally valid ways to create horror, and Mononoke does it by very carefully and very artistically confusing the shit out of you. Regardless of the length of the arc, it really doesn't take very long for the Mononoke to get restless or angry and just start wrecking everybody's day. Yokai or Ayakashi are not always, but a majority of the time, characterized as evil. But what makes a Mononoke special as a concept is that they are inherently evil spirits, physically connected to the negative emotions of a victimized human. That contradiction upsets the balance, and the pressure builds on the backs of the still-living people involved. The show is one part murder mystery, one part folktale, and one part surreal horror, with the operative words being mystery, folktale, and mostly just surreal, to the letter of the definition. Once the conflict takes off, the world starts completely unraveling, overtaken by the will of the Mononoke. The goings-on of the series are representative of the subconscious, fueled by them, or some chaotic, unholy union of the two, and that sounds like a hot mess, but it's so tightly executed that you tend not to notice. Everything about Mononoke is done the hard way, and it creates a dizzying and suffocating atmosphere, from the achingly realized art to the carefully selected camera movements to the hypnotic and evocative sound design. Yes, I said sound design, and I'm gonna harp on this, because I need you to understand the creativity that goes into nurturing extrasensory horror. <laughs> The function of most sound design is, especially in animation, to be less than noticeable. To seem natural, blend into the scene so you don't realize how awkward some of what goes on in a given cut is. If you've ever watched one of those sitcom videos without the laugh track or a fight scene with realistic punching sounds, you'll know exactly what I mean. Mononoke's surrealist atmosphere goes even further beyond, and it stands out because it supplements the mood and the ambiguity of the action. Remember that scene from The Matrix 2 where the French guy makes special coating for a steak that makes women really horny? It's kind of like that, but less gross and about sound. Your brain needs to connect what's happening with feelings and experiences you understand, so the audio team picked out and or personally made a wholly ethereal soundscape just to fill in the gaps the visual story leaves open. It creates and relieves tension all on its own, giving context to a traditional minimalist score and breathing life into abstract concepts regarding the psyche. This is not the exception, either. It's the rule. The sudden shifts in animation technique, the eye-melting color palettes, the subtle inflections of every hand-picked little word, they're more than just symbolic. They're indicative of advanced technical practices, executed with military precision. Mononoke is consistently spoken of as experimental, but that word implies any presence of uncertainty. The series was indisputably innovative, but the production team was in complete control of their narrative. They knew exactly what they wanted. So why didn't they get it? <laughs> is, without much resistance from me, capital C Culture. Highbrow, avant-garde, Frank Reynolds wearing a white wig art. It is also, and I say this with only the utmost respect as an amateur anthropologist, exceedingly Japanese. It takes place around the end of the Edo period, and its narrative architecture is very culturally specific. 
The lack of a one-to-one -one translation for the very important special sword word should be evidence enough, but even the human conflicts are pretty Japan-centric when it comes to its competing value systems. Still, historically speaking, cultural specificity isn't generally enough to bury a masterpiece. Despite its limitless critical acclaim, Mononoke tends to fall short in popularity and influence against its conceptual relatives like Mushishi, Monogatari, and likely a fourth anime that starts with M and stars some kind of spooky detective. It could be the lack of a popularity-bolstering source material that kept the series stuck in cult classic territory, or maybe its surreal horror and conflicted aesthetic make it less accessible than something like Mushishi, which focused on a lighter kind of philosophy and presented a more lush and beautiful world. Whatever the case, Mononoke left less of a mark than it should have, especially in the West. I always see it categorized as the kind of show you watch to impress that friend. It's a shame, because that comes with a stigma. It reads as pretentious and takes away from what's just a good show, and it kind of feels like a defense mechanism from a fandom that just loves its trash. So for today, I will be that friend, just for you. Impress me, you fucking casuals. Look, I love anime. I love all of its narrative flaws, its stupid, crazy plot lines, its endless internal soliloquies, its tendency to show you flashbacks from like 10 minutes ago. But anime has changed significantly since 2007, almost exclusively for the better. Isekai and simul dubs are on the hot seat, but everything else is better. Mononoke was aggressively ahead of its time and deserves to be recognized for what it accomplished. To a certain extent, even, it is. You'll be hard-pressed to find someone who's seen this show that won't, at the very least, admit it does what it wants to and does it well. But Mononoke's reason was more than to simply be acknowledged as a successful experiment. The team that made it wanted to challenge the limitations of the medium by challenging its viewers. And it's safe to say that while they did, the reach just wasn't there. I don't believe that viewers don't want to be challenged. We all love trash, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But we like thought-provoking art, too. Those affections aren't mutually exclusive. I honestly don't know why Mononoke is such an underwatched series. I wasn't there to pool the data. I was nine when it came out. My knowledge of anime at the time was that if I fell asleep watching TV at my grandma's house, I might wake up to Naruto teaching the bad guy about friendship. I truly hope that people go back to give Mononoke a chance. Experimental works can be educational, and technical achievements aside, it's just a really good show. It's important to know and appreciate where it all came from. Challenging and surreal anime like Wonder Egg Priority might not have come to pass without it. There's also Misaki Yuasa to thank, but that's another video that's gonna take me a really long time to make. Mononoke?